Hello, my name is Vanessa Kaufman and I'm the director of the Alliance to Stop Foodborne Illness. It's once again my pleasure to welcome you to a series of webinars on food safety culture brought to you by the Alliance and the United States Food and Drug Administration. We've had over a thousand participants during each of the last two webinars, which exemplifies your commitment and interest in food safety culture. I'm really excited about today's webinar. Not only have we added 15 more minutes uh, to the Q&A after running out of time last time, uh, but we're now offering NEHA certified continuing education credits for participation. This wonderful idea came to us through the post survey, uh, the post webinar survey. We're doing that a little different this time. Uh, there'll be a survey monkey link that will be emailed to you along with the slides and a YouTube link where you can watch the webinar again, or you can share with your colleagues who might've missed today. Uh, next slide, please. I do have a few housekeeping rules to note. First, all participants will be muted, so please use the Q&A function to ask questions, uh, not the chat function. You can also upvote questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, so the questions that have the most upvotes and rise to the top will be the ones that get asked first. Also, this event is being recorded. It'll be posted to the STOP website and to YouTube. And like I mentioned before, you can now earn continuing education credits for this webinar. A form will be attached in the follow-up email that'll have all the details. And next slide, please. I'd also like to walk through the agenda really quickly. So first we'll hear from Donald Prater, the Associate Commissioner for Imported Food Safety at FDA and Conrad Schwarnier, Director of the Office of Analytics and Outreach at FDA CIFSAM. Lone Jesperson, principal at Cultivate and your moderator for today, will briefly set the stage and pass it off to our guest speakers. Today, we are excited to showcase the work in building coalitions of food safety champions from two highly esteemed companies. Dale Estep, Corporate Food Safety and Quality Assurance Manager, and Ellison Beasley, R&D Food Safety Scientist at McKee Foods, and Charlene Gamunder, Blue Apron's Chief Operating Officer, will give their perspectives on how to build a coalition of culture champions across your organization. We'll then have an opportunity to ask our panelists your questions and hopefully have a lively discussion. Don and Conrad, welcome back to our third webinar. The floor is yours. Thanks, Vanessa. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Conrad Schwinier. And I'm Don Prater. And we'd like to uh, welcome you to this third webinar. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So Conrad and I are actually the co-leads for food safety culture, and that's one of the four core elements within our new era of smarter food safety. So I wanted to just take a minute today and share with you some of the things that we're doing uh, in the new era of smarter food safety. We're working to promote food safety culture throughout the food system. So things that we're doing, such as this webinar, uh, we're also engaging with industry, academia, and our food safety regulatory counterparts. We're working to further promote food safety culture throughout the agency. What this means is we're doing our foundational work, our homework. Uh, we're conducting a literature review, developing a resource library. We're even uh, developing and conducting training for, uh, for our staff so that we can better understand what food safety culture is, how we can take it into account. And then also we are looking to promote food safety culture within the home with consumers. So we're recognizing that consumers now have the availability in some cases of smart kitchen equipment. They're being reached through different media, uh, social media and different devices. And so we need to take into account these messages, these opportunities, and be able to adapt and, uh, and promote food safety culture with consumers as well. Let's move to the next slide. Over to you, Lone. Thank you so much, Don. Um, and thank you very much for the, uh, for the kind introduction here to our topic. So for today, what we're going to be looking at is uh, building a coalition of champions for food safety culture in your organization. And uh, it's going to be a cracking agenda as Vanessa, Dawn and Conrad have, has already alluded to. So let me just take five minutes to set the stage. Next slide, please. So if we're looking at uh, building a coalition of champions, we've got to figure out, so what is a champion and, and why, should, why should it matter in, our, in the context of food safety culture? 
So uh, Bahel and Nata, they conducted this, uh, this study um, some time ago now, but it's, it's very much valid still. They had uh, two groups of uh, participants in the study. They handed out two separate lottery tickets, one where the participants got to choose their own number and the other group where the participants uh, were given a number. They came back a couple of days later and they asked all of the participants, can we please buy back your tickets? The one group that was given a number said, yeah, you can. Uh, it's about $2 a, a piece, so $2 for a lottery ticket. The group that had been allowed to take or select their own number, they said, mm -mm, yeah, you can have it, but it's $8 a piece. So those that were allowed to have some personal influence and really bond with the topic of, I have a lottery ticket, I'm gonna put the birthday of my firstborn or something else that was very personal to them down on the lottery ticket, the price just went up with $6 for a lottery ticket. So when we're looking at, next slide please, when we're looking at why uh, your organization should invest in a coalition of champions, I think it's because we have to acknowledge that we have to um, give people some personal in, uh, impact to what it is that they do for food safety every day and how they help your company move through change as you're trying to change your food safety culture. This is why we talk so much about that food safety culture lives in and throughout and across an organization. And unless we have um, really strong champions in the form of a coalition, we might not be able to change the statistic of that one in every three food safety changes that you make are likely to succeed. And this came from uh, about 114 companies that we've measured food safety culture in at Cultivate. So we have a track record of not being so strong at managing change that really gives us the results that we were hoping for. And your coalition of champions is really one of the unlocks to get more out of your change efforts. So if we take the next slide, please. So as we're looking at formulating these, uh, this coalition of champions, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you very much. As we're looking at formulating this uh, coalition of champions, there's a couple of tips we can take out of social science. The first one that I'd like to just pass on to you is this power of personalizing. We just saw that in the study um, that Bar Hill and Netar has conducted about the price of the lottery tickets. In other words, those are your champions, those that bonded with the topic. The other tip uh, that I think is really uh, relevant for all of us is this notion of a guiding coalition. A guiding coalition comes out of Cotter's work and he has shown the value of this for a long, long time. It's quantifiable when there is actually a group that uh, takes on food safety or some or the change that you're trying to manage um, and leading that forward. But it's more than team. So let's look at what that means. If we can have the next slide, please. From a champion perspective, so something to think about there, and you'll hear much more about this from Dale Ellison from Charlene today. Champions are somebody that bonds with food safety at a personal level, and certainly Stop Foodborne Illness is a venue for you to uh, get material around doing that. It's also a, an individual that's impactful, often in, it's an informal leader, uh, but has that uh, influence, uh, able, ability to influence others. They also come equipped with this growth mindset or this love of learning. So they're not stagnant, they're not static in the way of thinking about food safety or the organization in totality, and therefore they're really ready for change. And this example of Nova Scotia, Mary, one that I have a um, long time ago that my um, good friend and, and uh, mentor at Maple Leaf Foods, Randy Hoffman, and I were out in Nova Scotia. Mary was working on a line. Randy stuck her hand, his hand in and took a, a label out and Mary told him she was working the line. He was the chief food safety officer, but she ran after him, told him that under no certain circumstances was he supposed to do that again. Mary uh, definitely bonded at a personal level. She was impactful as an informal leader and she had this love of learning. So if you're looking at the, the food safety coalition, and again, you're going to hear much more about that today. It's where there's a willingness to have an honest conflict. So we're not beating around the bush. We're actually bringing forward what needs to change. It's also made up of leadership or individuals that have leadership uh, capacity. And again, you'll hear more about that today and uh, are seen to have credibility within the organization. So one of our clients, they have a foreign material eradication program and they have built this program out with exactly uh, that uh, social norm of that we will tell each other if something doesn't work and we're going to keep pushing that forward. 
but it's a correlation because you might have multiple of these teams across your organization and they all come together into this correlation. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Dale. And Dale, I know you have some really in, uh, exciting stories for us uh, to tell about McKee. Great, thanks Sloan. If I can get our first slide, please. All right, so I'm Dale Esta, and I've been working with, uh, or I've been at McKee Foods Corporation for a little over 30 years. And the majority of that time has been in our R&D department. And it's currently my pleasure to be part of our great food safety and quality team. Next slide. Our company makes what I hope are some of your favorite snack cakes. We're best known for our Little Debbie brand, but we also produce or sell all the brands that you can see here. We have three production locations, one in Tennessee, one in Arkansas, and one in Virginia, along with a distribution center in Kingman, Arizona. If you would like more information about our company, you can look us up on the web at www.mckeefoods.com. <clears throat> our company has always made it a priority to treat people honestly, fairly, and with respect. And this is not just something on paper as part of our guiding values, but the leadership at McKee lives by this practice and encourages others to do the same. Over the past several years, the leadership at McKee has placed an even stronger focus on our overall culture by providing training at many levels throughout the company in the areas of mutual learning and living systems, which is a way of thinking that encourages you to look at your behaviors and mindsets in order to help you improve relationships and interactions with others and provide a better understanding of the why behind everything we do, like keeping your product safe. I'm part of a food safety leadership team with key stakeholders from R&D, engineering, and food safety, safety representatives from all of our plants. And this team provides direction on key food safety issues and initiatives. I know like many other companies, here at McKee Foods, we have great food safety programs, procedures, and training. But because a significant portion of food safety practices are behavior-based, we felt that building and maintaining a strong food safety culture was essential to a healthy, robust food safety system. Next slide, please. So about three years ago, our food safety leadership team decided to charter a food safety culture team with some of the objectives that you see listed here. First was developing a true north objective, then coming up with metrics, which if some of you have started this process, know how challenging it can be, especially when thinking about behaviors. Then of course, you have to determine what the current food safety culture is to use as your performance baseline, and then come up with a multi-year strategy for creating initiatives to enhance food safety by utilizing things like behavioral science techniques and approaches. And then finally, implementing food safety, the a food safety culture plan across the company. We wanted this team to be cross-functional with people who already exhibited a strong safety mentality. In other words, some current food safety champions. We also wanted at least a few with some exposure to mutual learning and living systems thinking. Allison was chosen to lead this team, so I'll let her talk about their journey in both developing themselves and others in the organization as food safety champions. Thanks, Dale. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ellison Beasley, a food safety scientist at McKee Foods. So like Dale said, in late 2019, I was asked to create a team to look at our food safety culture. And culture in general has been a huge focus at McKee for many years now. So I was fortunate that we already had many key players throughout the organization bought into the importance of taking a deeper look at our mindsets and social norms at McKee. We've all seen an iceberg model similar to what I'm showing on the slide, but the MOS or McKee operating system is our approach to culture. It's essentially how we approach health, AKA how we run the business and performance which is how we maintain profitability. So we're all so used to operating in the technical space, especially as scientists, but obviously we need to dig a bit deeper to get to the changes we're wanting to see in behavior. 
When Lone asked us to participate in this webinar on creating a coalition of champions for food safety culture, I knew sharing the story of our food safety culture team was the main thing I wanted to focus on with you today. Because putting the right people on your culture team is going to make all the difference when it comes to the energy and longevity behind your cultural initiatives. Next slide, please. So to build this team of food safety champions, we started off by nominating people we knew were already well-respected and influential in their departments. The size of the team is really important as well. We wanted to keep the team small enough so that everybody remained bought in and active on the team, but large enough so that we could get all these different perspectives and voices in the room to actually gain insight into what's really going on out there. You need frontline supervision, but you also need upper management present so that when you're discussing issues, you can truly see the gaps that exist between those two realities. The model I'm showing on the slide really is the basis of what we've done with our culture work. Essentially, the pyramid of visibility shows the amount of risks visible to people at various levels in an organization. So as you can see, the further removed you are from the process, the less you know. So we're learning to listen to our people sitting at different levels in our organization and respect the reality that they're experiencing. We wanted to make sure to utilize this principle when building our culture team as well. So we started developing this group with members from essentially all of our major departments in manufacturing, production, QA, sanitation, maintenance, everybody. We made sure to get an assortment of people from different facilities, shifts, and again, different levels. And I basically approached each person individually and asked them to join this team and kind of explained what we were hoping to accomplish with a food safety culture team. And I made it very clear that they did not have to join this team and add this responsibility to their already full plates if they didn't want to, or they could choose to leave the team at any time. Participating in this team really was voluntary, and I truly think that that was key. If you have people on your team who don't really want to be there or just can't devote the energy to it that you need, you're setting yourself up to fail. So fast forward, everyone agrees to join the team. And from the very beginning, we spent a lot of intentional time building trust within that team and creating this psychological safety so that we could discuss what we call the undiscussables. Because I mean, culture gets touchy, right? Like, People get defensive when you start digging into their behavior and challenging their mental models. So our team immediately set some ground rules and we agreed to follow them and hold each other accountable. So we start meeting, talking all the typical food safety culture strategies that Dale mentioned previously, baseline data, survey, true north, metrics, et cetera. We were all so overwhelmed as I'm sure many of you are today on the call. Even so, we persevered and accomplished some of these things, um, but after a while, it just felt like we weren't really making a lot of progress and still not many people outside of our team really knew who the team was, right, or what our objectives were. So we took a step back and reflected on our team and our goals, and we kind of realized that we had been a bit too results-oriented because, I mean, come on, that's kind of what we're all used to, right? Um, but this team wasn't really designed for that. We really wanted to take a deep dive into the state of our culture. Also, I do want to say that, and this might sound a little bit strange, but this team was never responsible for the regulatory piece of food safety culture. So we never had to like check that box. Um, and that meant that our team didn't really have that added pressure to it. We just genuinely were trying to assess and improve our people's behaviors. And I realize that's probably a little unorthodox, uh, but I truly think that's part of what has made our team so successful. So we decided that in order to gain more champions of food safety culture outside of our team and really get people talking about the topic, uh, we wanted to create our own personalized food safety culture maturity model. And I don't know if any of you have attempted something like this, but let me tell you, it's not easy. Uh, we spent well over a year creating our initial model, which was based on our seven MOS, Mickey operating system principles, which includes things like our people feel valued and total organizational thinking. We used real examples that everyone could really relate to in the model. 
the kind of thing where when you hear it, you're just like, oh yeah, I've heard that before. Or like, I recognize that. And then we essentially took that model and took it on tour throughout our organization and presented it to any group that would have us. Purchasing, plant management teams, you name it. And we just talked about it as a group. And we used this model simply as a conversation piece. And you could see things kind of starting to click for people. You could see them begin to identify how food safety related to their role and how they were either hurting or helping our culture with their behavior. Having this model showed people where we were at and then clearly defined where we were trying to go with food safety culture, which originally was kind of part of the struggle. Food safety culture, just felt so abstract to people, uh, but this model really helps make our culture journey more tangible for our employees. And that definitely helps them buy into it more as well. So even though this model started off as something we hoped uh, to use for metrics and data, we ultimately deemed it to be a tool for self-reflection. And it truly worked for us. We've witnessed great conversations around food safety in many different areas within the organization. Our goal with this maturity model and these discussions is to help us close the gaps that exist when one level of management doesn't understand the reality that exists below them. And through each conversation, we're gaining more champions for food safety culture and more momentum. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, no, previous. Yep, there we go. So, okay, it's certainly not a fast process, uh, but we've chosen the approach of changing our culture one conversation at a time. And in doing so, we've created an internal network of champions for our cause. And over time, with everyone using their sphere of influence, our mindsets are going to shift and our behavior is going to change as a result. So, key takeaways here for you guys. Number one, build yourself a solid team. Take the time to build trust and psychological safety within that team so that you can have these unmuted conversations around your culture. And don't get so caught up in the surveys and the metrics that you lose sight of what you're really trying to do here. You can try and strategize your way through food safety culture all day long, but at least for us and the key, that's not where we saw the most progress. And lastly, don't get discouraged. It took years probably decades to define your current culture. And this isn't going, this change that you're looking for is just not gonna happen overnight. But creating little wins for you and your team does go a long way in ensuring continued support and energy around food safety culture. Next slide, please. So with that, thank you for your time and attention. And I will pass it over to Charlene at Blue Apron. Thank you, Allison. I, I loved hearing the approach McKee Foods has taken to instilling a food safety culture. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Charlene Gamunder, and I am Blue Apron's Chief Operating Officer. I'm gonna take you through a different approach that we've employed at my company to build a coalition of food safety culture champions across our organization. Next slide, please. At Blue Apron, we empower people to create incredible culinary experiences at home through our meals. We provide direct to consumer meal kits with chef designed recipes. And each recipe comes with quality and seasonal ingredients that allow customers to create amazing home cooked meals. Every week, our customers can choose from over 55 options that range from our core recipes to add-ons like appetizers or desserts, to heat and eat meals ready in less than five minutes. We ship boxes with pre-portioned fresh ingredients and step-by-step -step instructions to thousands of customers around the country. Next slide, please. We are very excited to share that this year is our 10th anniversary and we continue to deliver amazing meals to people's kitchens. To date, we've served more than 5.3 million customers and shipped more than 465 million meals. We serve the contiguous US from two FDA regulated and SQF certified fulfillment centers 
based in Linden, New Jersey and Richmond, California. We have over 2000 employees who help us ensure our boxes leave our facilities safely. Next slide, please. Okay, so at Blue Apron, we are committed to providing safe, high quality ingredients every time, everywhere. And we believe it all starts with making sure that our food safety priorities are communicated, understood, implemented, and maintained at all levels of the organization. Food safety culture is present in each step of Blue Apron operations. We believe it is the responsibility of all of our colleagues at every level of the organization to understand, embrace, and enact our safety culture. For us, we create food safety culture champions by one, establishing expectations around food safety culture for every new employee on day one. Two, scheduling regular interactive training sessions for all levels, which develop critical thinking skills to empower employees to embody our food safety culture daily. And three, driving accountability cross-functionally through a series of robust verification activities. And four, leveraging tools and technology to monitor performance trends and make data-driven decisions. We believe that instituting a culture of food safety comes from the top. And it's all underpinned by the commitment of the leadership team. We do so by first implementing a documented food safety and quality management system that is strongly supported by our executive leadership team. Our food safety policy is communicated to all levels of employees to ensure understanding and to promote compliance. We do this so that we can feel confident that each decision made that impacts a customer's experience has all of the food safety and quality attributes in mind to ensure that safe and wholesome food is first on the list of priorities when building a box. Next slide, please. Our detailed education on food safety begins at a new associate's orientation. All employees are introduced to the Blue Apron operation in a classroom setting where we give detailed scenarios so that they know what to expect during their daily tasks and how they can contribute to the safety of our product. We explain the reasons behind our food safety policies in order to help connect the fulfillment operation with our end consumers. The new hire experience does not end in the classroom. Orientation continues in a hands-on practical setting where each employee is shown the correct way to enter the production area with a full understanding of good manufacturing practices. Employees gain first-hand experience in their role and learn how each step of the process can affect food safety. Many of these role-specific expectations are spelled out in a skills matrix that is used by each department leader to monitor training effectiveness. At Blue Apron, we use a process of layered auditing to provide continuous feedback and coaching related to our employees' performance, including the performance of our leaders in maintaining our food safety culture. Recently, we've introduced a process of certification for each role, which ensures that associates can and do perform the expectations as outlined in their training. Next slide, please. As part of building a coalition of food safety culture champions, ongoing training and reinforcement is key to maintaining the culture. Every month, we hold an interactive leadership training program. All leaders across the organization come together to share best practices and engage with a rotating list of topics. These topics include general leadership competencies, such as approachability, compassion, and conflict resolution, as well as high level food safety topics such as GMPs, sanitation principles, recalls and traceability, and the basic principles of HACCP. The sessions last half a day and are led by a cross-functional group of leaders and peers. As a team, we look at realistic situations that allow the team to learn from one another 
through collaborative communication and dynamic problem solving. We use the opportunity to celebrate wins and highlight challenges from day-to-day -day experiences. Additionally, we maintain an annual training register for all hourly employees that features both workplace safety and food safety curriculum. These trainings are built into our operational schedules each month where the sessions are tracked to ensure compliance and in order to hold all departments accountable. Next slide, please. To encourage high compliance of our GMP policy in our production areas, we have designed a highly visible GMP area where our employees wash their hands, don hairnets and gloves, and are issued clean smocks. The area is actually designed to encourage proper habits so that we are compliant as a team. Our food safety culture is clearly on display here as our associates hold themselves and each other accountable for GMP compliance. I've personally seen associates jump in to inform a visitor that they've missed a step in the GMP process prior to entering the production floor. Accountability is also closely monitored and managed by the food safety and quality assurance teams in our sites. Audits and inspections are performed daily in accordance with the most recent SQF code. We monitor adherence to practices such as segregation of allergens, labeling compliance, and stock rotation, just to name a few. We report on the status of our food safety system with a comprehensive food safety health score for both of our fulfillment centers that is compiled weekly. This score blends important inputs such as cleaning effectiveness using ATP squabs, the, the master sanitation schedule compliance, consumer complaints and corrective actions and our environmental monitoring program. All these measures are shared across the facility, reviewed at the leadership level and built into individual performance goals for the cross-functional leadership team. These practices of metric review and performance alignment help to demonstrate management commitment and reinforce our food safety culture. Finally, we also hold suppliers accountable from the start through our supplier approval and expectations program, which is modeled after the GFSI SQF scheme. The supplier qualification process ensures that the procurement team also upholds our food safety culture because we rely on them to find sources that can meet our stringent food safety requirements. They are active participants in partnership with our FSQA team in qualifying vendors, and they understand and embrace our food safety management system. Here again, I can tell you that I've personally witnessed members of our procurement team explaining to potential vendors that their practices just won't stand up to our food safety requirements. While accountability underpins the food safety culture at Blue Apron, we also leverage technology to set and manage expectations and ensure that our performance meets and exceeds standards. Next slide, please. Our business is built on leadership, culture, and human connection. However, we're also deeply rooted in data, which allows us to keep track of our work and make strategic decisions that drive continuous improvement. We use proprietary technology like our warehouse management system, consumer feedback platform, and recipe management tools that provide dynamic dashboards to help us monitor performance and identify trends. These innovative technologies allow us to show progress and provide feedback in real time. Our reporting capabilities make it easy for leadership to identify strong performing individuals and celebrate them with rewards and recognition. These types of incentives tie back into the culture of food safety that was presented on an employee's first day at Blue Apron. Recently, we've actually implemented a gain share program which further incentivizes the fulfillment center employees to put safe and wholesome food in the hands of each of our customers. Employees receive a financial reward when the company improves across a number of key drivers. Food safety and quality are heavily weighted in the program 
to emphasize how integrated the food safety culture is in everything that we do. Next slide, please. As you can see, there are many ways to build a coalition of food safety culture champions across an organization. And at Blue Apron, we are committed to creating cross-functional champions starting from day one. We establish clear expectations, develop ongoing training, hold our teams accountable, and leverage data to educate our decisions and incentivize our teams, all while having management commitment from our top leaders. I'm proud of Blue Apron's work in industry leadership and food safety. And I truly believe that we are at the forefront of food safety standards. Food safety is embedded in everything we do. I look forward to your questions later in the session. Thank you. And I'll turn that over to Lone. Thank you so much, Charlene. And I am gonna invite all of our speakers to come back on video here. Um, and I see in the in the Q&A here that you have a ton of great questions and I can almost guarantee you that we will not get to all of them, but we will get some answers back to you. So if we can get Dale, Ellison, Conrad, Dawn, Vanessa and Charlene back on video, that would be fantastic. And then uh, we'll start with our Q&A um, to get as much out of this part of the, the webinar as possible. And Dale, if I can start with uh, a question for you that's come up. Um, and uh, maybe you and, and Alison can tag team on this one. You talked a lot about building trust within your cul culture team. Uh, specifically, how did you do that? Sure, Lon. That, that is a great question. Um, so I'll kind of try and set the stage. And then, Alison, maybe you could you know, share some details about what that looked like with the team. So um, in her presentation, you know, Alison was talking about the iceberg and how culture gets into those behaviors and mindsets, um, you know, that are well below the surface that we don't always see in our day-to-day -day activities. And um, so one of our production managers, who's a good friend of mine, um, agreed to be part of this team. And both of us had, had the privilege of going through some of these behavior trainings that I talked about earlier in my presentation. So we kind of felt like it would be useful to make some time early on with this team to go through some of those exercises. Because you do have to develop that trust aspect within the team before you know, they can be willing to dive into some of these deeper issues. Mm -hmm. So Ellison, maybe you can share some of the specifics, you know, what that looked like. Yeah, so um, we had a few like in-person all day workshops prior to COVID, so this is back in 2019. And we spent um, kind of a lot of time initially doing what felt kind of like com complaining. Um, but really we were just like sitting there sharing our stories and our realities. And we kind of had to do that in order to build that trust and be able to move forward and come up with a plan to move forward. Um, and our team focused a lot on the concept of PIES, which involves bringing your full self to work. PIES is in the acronym, like physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And that helped us gain a lot of trust um, on the team, when you get to show up as your authentic self to work, um, it makes a big difference. And so we also spent a lot of time studying mutual learning um, from Roger Schwartz. So reinforcing concepts like focusing on interests, right? And not positions per se, um, discussing the undiscussables and explaining your reasoning. Um, things like that have helped us build this psychological safety on our team. Um, and basically everyone on the team just kind of made a commitment to be trusting and respectful and you know, not have meetings after the meeting. Um, and we just hold each other accountable for that. Um, and if you can't get to a place like that with your team, I would suggest you kind of take a step back and look at your team as a whole and ask yourself, do I really have the right people on this team? Brilliant. Absolutely. Lots to learn there. And, and I love the, the scientific approach that you've taken at, at McKee. Um, Don and Conrad, I think we should just get it out of the way. <laughs> um, it's the uh, it's the standard question for Don and Conrad, and I'm going to just read it out the way it's phrased here. What would be the role of federal, state, and local health departments 
that do food safety inspections, education, and regulation in the process of developing a strong food safety culture in companies and the public. Over to you, Don. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. That, that's a question we get. Uh, you know, one of the things, as I mentioned, is we're really looking at food safety culture from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, what does it mean as a regulator? Um, we recognize that food safety culture is really uh, an emerging discipline within food safety. There's actually been quite a lot of literature published over the last 10 or 15 years. We're, I, we're doing this, uh, this literature review. But we're also looking at what does it mean from a regulatory standpoint? We recognize that uh, other food safety regulators maybe are building this into their regulations. Um, we're taking a little bit different approach. Certainly, we want to understand food safety culture. What impact does it have on public health? How can we measure it potentially? And then finally, how can we take it into account? Um, I think as Charlene mentioned, we're using a lot of data and information these days, looking at, at different outcomes and things. And so we really want to understand this and see how we can take it into account. It's about psychology and motivating people's behavior. It goes beyond and it's different uh, from compliance with the regulations. Of course, it's part and parcel of that. And we want to have uh, very robust discussions with our uh, counterparts uh, at the state and local level um, in terms of you know, how can we look at food safety culture and be able to recognize it and take it into account when we believe a firm has a strong food safety culture. Having said that, we're still on a journey, very much on a journey. We will be engaging with our uh, stakeholders along the way. So this is a question that comes up frequently. I'm happy to uh, have the opportunity to, to try to answer that. Conrad, anything else that you would like to add uh, on that point? Yeah, I wanted to echo what Don said. You know, I think today's webinar showcased two very different approaches to food safety culture within two different, very different organizations. And so from a regulatory standpoint, you know, we, we, we're not in a position to dictate uh, a certain approach or dictate a certain uh, a culture and try and impose it. And so we are in this process, as Don said, to, to learn ourselves like, well, how best can we as a regulatory agency assess food safety culture? And then how best can we support food safety culture across the food chain? And if I can jump in, I'd love to ask a question of Charlene. Charlene, you've gotten a lot of questions here in the Q&A. I don't know if you've had a chance to look through them. Um, <laughs> I know it's a little hard. Uh, but so I'm curious what your biggest challenges were as you started building your coalition. Um, and there's a lot of questions in the Q&A about how technology might have helped solve some of those challenges. So I, I think one of the biggest challenges has been coming up with approaches to accountability that doesn't feel like it's all punitive. And, um, and I think we have a, a number of approaches we've used. I talked a bit about our metrics process and we use technology to come up with a comprehensive uh, food safety score basically uh, for our facilities every week, which is reviewed weekly with the leadership team and discussed on down through the, to the to the floor. And that um, the metrics are driven obviously from the technology that we can get that information in a very timely fashion. And we use that not only to look at how a facility is performing, but we also align that with individual performance plans. So we're very clear um, as we develop individual performance plans about the expectations and using some of the data that we get, the metrics to, um, to drive that. And so it is clearly setting expectations without a punitive uh, aspect to it. But you know, I believe in telling people exactly what we expect up front and making sure that cross-functionally, everybody understands that they are responsible for food safety. It's not one department's job over there. It is everybody's and making sure that it falls in everybody's performance plan. They understand what role they play in, in our food safety program. Brilliant, Charlene. And I think um, having you as CRO in this kind of conversation demonstrates that as well, that it's certainly not just for food safety and quality. So 
Thank you for that. <laughs> it can't be. It no, can't be. <laughs> for sure. Um, we, we have a question that's getting a lot of attention in the Q&A, which I really appreciate the question, which is around, um, it, it is around size of your of your food safety coalition, um, but maybe we can just broaden it out a little bit and, and talk about how did you decide on uh, both who should be on your uh, food safety coalition and also the size, because um, that seems to be of interest for sure. And Dale, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here first, if sure. I could. Yeah, no, as we looked at our or thought about our creating this team, um, one thing we wanted to make sure was, you know, having the different production facilities, we wanted voices from each of those facilities as part of that team. And then just thinking about the different departments. So um, I don't know that we necessarily had a specific headcount size in mind, but we were thinking at least maybe, you know, three to no more than four from each location. But then within that location, we also tried to think about, okay, we want maybe someone from sanitation included, someone from maintenance, you know, definitely production. Um, and so that was kind of our approach was just to think about making sure we had voices from different departments included on that team. So that as, as Ellison talked about having those conversations later, those one conversations at a time, we made sure we had voices that could go out and influence their area that or their area that they have influence over. And so that was kind of the approach that we took at McKee. Charlene, thoughts from you on that one? Yeah, and you, I mean, clearly you can see our approach has been different and, and there is no one right approach for everyone that fits. Um, I think for us, we look at our champions across all the different functions. And we, again, we believe it's everyone's job and we, and everybody plays a role. And so, of course, uh, we have participants in terms of the production folks, the sanitation folks, the maintenance, we need that cross-functionally, but it goes even beyond that. When I did give you an example of procurement and the role procurement plays uh, in food safety, and they they have to be part of our champions. The other piece that, and you know, we have a culinary team, a, a team of you know highly skilled and respected chefs that play a significant role in our food safety programs. And we also have um, you know everybody that is involved in product development, and and it starts from the very beginning when they have they conceive of an idea for a product. They are very focused on the food safety aspects of it. It is instilled in them and, and our process to uh, source, to, to find potential suppliers that, that the chefs believe can, can do that, to, to qualify them, to, um, to consider all of those things. We have to have food safety champions in every department across the board. It's truly, truly cross-functional. We cannot have FSQA folks in every meeting doing this. Everybody has to be on the same team for this. For oh, sure. Vanessa, before you jump in there, should we just give Alison a chance maybe to, to see if there's any, or sorry, Alison, to see if there's anything from McKee that, we, that you would like to add? Or did Dale do such a cracking job that there's just nothing to add? No, I mean, Dale, Dale did a great job. I will say, you know, our, our Food Safety Culture team has about 12 or 13 individuals on it, and our company has about 6,000 employees, but um, we only have a handful of manufacturing facilities, so I, I can imagine if you worked for a very large organization that had, you know, facilities across the globe, your, your team might need to be a little bit larger than ours, but it just, it's kind of trial and error is the thing, like, we've had to, like, you know, you start out one way and you make adjustments and it's it's not going to be perfect the first go around, right? So just keep trying, keep moving forward is what I recommend. And I really like that, Ellison, uh, talking about how one size doesn't fit all. Um, and, you know, you might be a giant company or you might be a tiny company and things are going to look different for you. Uh, there is anonymous attendee um, posted a question that I would like to take selfishly uh, because it's directed towards STOP, uh, the organization I work for. And they ask, are there any strategies STOP and FDA have in mind to bring food safety culture to small proprietors, especially those in other cultures? 
And Lone and I have actually been working with a group uh, that's hosted by the Alliance um, on a toolkit that will be launched on June 7th, World Food Safety Day. And it'll be free, it'll be hosted on our website and it's aimed towards small and medium-sized companies. So while big guys can use it, uh, it's really geared towards those smaller companies and hopefully it has some amazing resources uh, that you can use to start your food safety culture journey. And uh, the question's also directed to FDA. So Don and Conrad, I don't know if you have something you wanna throw in there as well. All right, I'll add something and, and maybe Don can embellish on it, but we do have a team of folks in uh, the agency that are looking at how best to engage with our international partners, um, not on just food safety culture, but on, on all aspects of new era. And so Don and I will be working with that team to look at how, how we can start having these discussions uh, with other uh, our, inter our international partners and how best we might be able to foster and support food safety culture uh, at that level. And I'll just say uh, small and medium size, uh, you know, firms are actually, you know, very important in this. Some may actually be quite advanced, but others may need some uh, some help with their journey. So one of the things that I think we've observed is that there's a whole variety of different approaches and stages at which companies are. And so we hope that this webinar series and the toolkit, Vanessa, that you described will really help uh, help facilitate and promote food safety culture and those practical things that, that our panelists have uh, indicated today throughout the food system. Marvelous. Um, true to form, there's always a lot of interest in how we incentivize and recognize the behaviors that we'd like to see for the future. And um, I think uh, we should maybe just put all three uh, industry speakers here a little bit on the spot on that one. So what are some of your ways of incentivizing or recognizing, rewarding, celebrating the behaviors that you'd like to see for the future. And Charlene, do you want to kick us off on that one? Happy to do so, Lone. Um, you know, there are a lot of levers to pull when you are trying to, to instill a food safety culture. And incentives and disincentives are really important. And it always feels like in, in terms of accountability, we immediately gravitate to disincentives. And don't get me wrong, you, at some point you have to have those in place. I don't mean that they sh aren't important, but I also think it's critically important, particularly in, in creating a culture that you have incentives in place to celebrate successes and reward and recognize the, the appropriate behaviors you want. So um, I talked a little bit, I just briefly mentioned that we have um, certainly a, uh, a, a gain share type program that we have put in place at Blue Apron, which is incentivizing our employees to do the right things in terms of food safety. And we, um, we actually have it incredibly weighted um, to, to strongly uh, uh, incentivize the proper behaviors on, on food safety. But I would also tell you that we um, also put it in the individual performance plans and we, we get it down to that level so that people get incentives through their merit uh, performance pay. You know, that's, um, that's really important. So we've put in the gain share program that is a quarterly kind of bonus and incentivizes people, but we also have a, an annual performance plan for every individual that we, you know, you can be well rewarded if you are doing the right things and it's it's role specific. Super. Damn. Yeah. So um, one thing we try to do too um, is to think about recognition because people like to be recognized when they've done something right. And so I, I think we've kind of taken it to that level too with, with some of the stuff both the our core culture team, and even with some stuff they've done at one of our specific locations, they kind of got it started. And I think now it's kind of spreading throughout the company to think about how do you do recognition and, and is there a way to incentivize that too? So maybe I'll let Ellison just kind of follow up on the specifics on what that actually looked like. Yeah, we, um, we've done a couple things. So uh, we have this program called like the Food Safety Stars program where employees can nominate their coworkers or their superiors or whoever for, for just anything, whether it's, you know, doing food safety right every day, like this person just always does it right. 
or something like amazing, like, oh, they prevented this contamination and they deserve to be recognized for that. Um, and then those people get featured on, we call it the mix. It's like our social media platform at McKee. Um, and they also get like a signed certificate, uh, you know, saying they're a food safety star and recognizing them. It's signed by their plant's vice president. Um, and so, you know, people like to be recognized in different ways. Like some people don't want to be on the mix, but some people love the certificate. So we focus on that. Um, we're also doing, we're in the second year now of doing our food safety engagement competition. And so this year it's a competition between the plants. There's different ways you can get points when it comes to food safety. So we've kind of gamified it there. And then at the end of the year, whichever facility has the most points is gonna get some big sort of you know, celebration and a prize. And so we're just looking at ways to get creative and get people like excited about food safety, making it fun and recognizing individuals um, and taking that approach. That's splendid, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure there's much more to come on that particular topic and um, we are going to start wrapping up. And, I, and again, Vanessa, Don, Conrad, true to form, we run out of time, right? <laughs> so a couple of thoughts from Maya before I hand it back over to, to Don and Conrad. Um, I think it's very evident what we've heard from our speakers today that you have to personalize, you have to customize your plan to improving your, the maturity of your food safety culture. There is no, um, there's no checklist anywhere that, that can be uh, suited for everybody. It has to be built into what your organizational culture is and what works there. And I think, Ellison, you just wrapped that up beautifully for us with your recognition program at McKee. It is what functions within your culture, right? And, and Charlene, you shared what works obviously within Blue Apron. I think the second part I just wanted to wrap up with is this is a open um, dialogue and, and have a willingness and courage to have an open uh, and um, honest conflict. And um, I know we don't like to say that, but I think that's actually what uh, some of the success measures behind these two fabulous organizations, they're willing to have the tough conversation. And they do that in a trusted and psychologically safe environment. So I think those are just very high level. There's lots more detail to learn from all of you. Um, but thank you so much uh, from my end for, for sharing today. And I'll pass it back over to Don and, and Conrad. Thanks, Alon. I want to first thank very much Dale, Ellison, and Charlene for the great uh, presentations, the learning about the great things that you're all doing. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's clear that there's no one approach here. You, you've obviously taken... Uh, different approaches to establishing and promoting your food safety culture. Uh, and it sounds like it's a lot of work. Uh, and one of the, I've just been writing the things that you guys have been saying that resonate. And, and I think, uh, Charlene, you said it very well, that it's everybody's job and it can't just be one person's job. Um, and so I, the, the pointers that you provided in terms of starting small, persevering, building that trust, I think are gonna be very helpful for uh, everyone in today's webinar. And I very much appreciate uh, all of the time that you've taken and shared with us today. Thank you, Don. Yeah, thanks, Conrad. I'll, I'll add my thanks to all the folks that wrote questions into the chat. There's some really great questions there, a number that we didn't get to, but if there are opportunities to follow up on those, we surely will. But uh, thank you all for the participation in those great questions in the chat. We hope you've enjoyed the webinar today. Um, I'm also excited to tell you that uh, our next webinar uh, may actually come live from IAFP in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the International Association of Food Protection Annual Meeting. So uh, hopefully, um, yeah, awesome. There it is, the, the date and the time. So we are uh, looking forward to our next uh, webinar series. And again, thanks to everyone uh, for such great participation today. Back over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much. And yes, thank you to all of our speakers. And again, thinking about, you know, everybody has a different journey. Everybody's journey is going to look different and it's dependent on your size and your culture. So it's really wonderful to hear from these different companies that have had such different experiences. And, you know, thank you so much. And we are super fortunate that we are able to present live from IAFP. So uh, for those people who are going to be in lovely Pittsburgh uh, for the conference, please find us uh, on August 3rd. And if you aren't going to be in attendance, 
We're going to have the hybrid event, so don't worry. You can still uh, register and show up on Zoom, and we'll be there. And uh, for everybody who's here and registered uh, for this webinar, you'll get all those details in an email, and the recording and the slides will be coming your way shortly. Just give me a couple days to get them to you. Um, thank you so much, and we'll see you again on August 3rd.